The Action Aid Nigeria and other civil society organizations call for the reduction of salaries of political appointees and legislators. We discuss party primaries and internal democracy in the second segment with the new Nigeria People's Party, NNPP. Well, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anakov. The Action Aid Nigeria Civil Society Action Coalition on Education for All, Yaga Africa and others have called for a cut of salaries of the federal lawmakers and political appointees to fund education. Now, Country Director Action Aid Nigeria, NLB, stated this, uh, saying that it is demoralizing that the public universities that produced the present crop of leaders and manpower being currently enjoyed in the country are locked due to unresolved labor disputes between the lecturers and unions and the federal government. They also called for collective efforts to end the ongoing ASU strike in the interest of the nation's education and national development. In 2018, the senator representing Kaduna Central, Shehu Sani, revealed that he and his then colleagues received 13.5 million naira as running cost. Well, joining us to discuss this is Deji Awobide, and uh, he's a legal practitioner, and Biodo Shomi, who is a political analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. It's my Thank pleasure. You. Great. Um, so let's just start by looking at the running cost of members of our legislature. This is not the first time this conversation has been had. Nigerians have always continuously called for a cut in the running cost of the National Assembly, the take-home pay of the National Assembly, but it's all just been talk and there's never really been action. I remember when uh, Senator Bukala Saraki was the Senate president, there was also um, a cry for the finances of the National Assembly to be made plain so that Nigerians could know how much these people were earning. But I, I'm going to start with you, um, Deji. Do you think that this, this is another, you know, talk or water poured on the back of a chicken in terms of asking for a cost in pay? Well, thank you. Um, so firstly, you know that the Revenue Organization, Allocation and Fiscal Commission is empowered under the Constitution to fix remuneration for our legislators as well as other political office holders. Uh, specifically, Section 70, 84, 111, and 124 make that provision, in addition to Paragraph 32D of Part 1 to the third schedule of the Constitution. However, um, you will see that Roman Park has had a lot of difficulty in trying to implement um, its constitutional mandate of fixing remuneration for these political office holders. Mm -hmm. And the challenge itself stems from implementation, because you had, they've had two attempts at a review. Um, the first one was in 2009, we tried to review the package of these um, political office holders. Um, after the review, they submitted the report. They didn't follow up on it. In 2015, the same thing was done. They tried to review it as well. Um, the people who are supposed to actually implement these things, in other words, when the Ramafak does his own review, he submits it to the National Assembly, which is supposed to make it into an act, a law that guides it. So the extant law that we currently have is called the Certain Political, Public, and Judicial Officers, Office Holders, Salaries and Allowances Amendment Act of 2008. Now, since then, there have been efforts to review it all to no avail because the persons who are affected by it have uh, made themselves a stumbling block towards the actualization of this amendment. So, so in other words, you have a package. If you go to the Ramafak website, you'll find a package there. But that package does not reflect what they actually earn. So in theory, you have that, that there for all to access. But of course, there's no transparency as to how much they actually earn. And you've seen in the past um, few years that every National Assembly tries to untwist the executive into putting what their own budget should be into the national budget. In other words, they would not pass the budget or approve a budget unless uh, their own needs are worth taking care of. And of course, it also, also emphasizes that when it comes to these packages, uh, there is no division. They, I mean, they are united, even though they are from different tribes, different religions, different backgrounds. They are all united 
in ensuring that our collective, our common good is uh, looted by them. And there seems to be no end in sight into how to resolve this problem. And that's where we are currently as a people, that we can't owe them to any accountability because they are the persons who should actually pass this law and uh, that will be their amendments uh, and their packages. Uh, Mr. Shomi, let's look at the core of this call. The reason why this call was made in the first instance is because um, they're saying there's a deadlock between university lecturers, um, the unions, ASU, and, of course, the federal government. Um, and we know that it has entered, I think this is the 100th day uh, since universities had been shut down and the 100th day of that strike. And it might continue to linger if federal government and ASU do not come to some form of agreement. But let's do a quick um, side by side um, um, look at how much the university lecturers earn as opposed to what our National Assembly members earn. I mean, um, we've seen uh, the um, Shil Sani saying um, that they earn about 13.5 million, um, even though there are se several ridiculous allowances that we will get to uh, later in the conversation. So looking at these guys, what they're asking for, and what we have as pay for our National mm -hmm. Assembly members. Um, will there be a justification somewhat if this call were to be pushed further, um, if the budgeting um, or the budget of the National Assembly be cut into half to be able to deal with um, the problem of our ASU? Again, during um, the APC's um, um, form buying and people declar declaring their intentions, we also saw how much money's were being, uh, you know, doled out, whether it be by groups or associations or certain persons saying, well, we want to pick a form for you. People have also queried that, but that's a political party and that's not a government agency. It's not also an arm of the government. Um, in asking for this, how do we go about getting not just the legislature, but also the executive to the table with ASU? Yeah, um, we need to go a little bit backward to understand what is actually going on and why uh, the call for um, the reduction in, legs, the, in the salaries of um, uh, political office holders. Um, when you look at in 2005 or six, uh, the intention of um, the former president of Basoja when he declared that the he was going to monetize, you know, all the facilities, you know, housing and everything being enjoyed, you know, by legislators. Um, they went ahead and did that. Many of them bought the houses and bought the vehicles and all that. So they were expected to maintain those houses and vehicles. But immediately, Obasanjo left power. Uh, the next uh, turnaround is um, for the same legislators to hide on their uh, committee's um, uh, duties. They were not supposed to have any vehicle belonging to National Assembly, but they eat under the work of committees and bought the vehicles and claimed that the vehicles were for committees' work, uh, using the public funds, you know, um, against the monetization. So basically, they took one thing with one hand and also doubled it with another hand, um, um, you know, creating a very terrible situation for the whole country. Unfortunately, um, the federal government will not do anything about it because they expected the legislatures are expected to, you know, to pass the law. But if they fail to enact the law, then there's nothing um, anybody can do, just like they just said. Now, when you now move a bit further and look at the report of Orosai's report um, on that, Jonathan, I think it was 2012 or uh, 2013 or 14, when Orosai came up with the report that are duplications of existing functions you know, of um, statutory agencies. You know, in some cases, you have multiplication of, you know, agencies. Um, uh, essentially, politicians using it for job for the boys, rather than harmonizing those agencies and creating one agency to deal with one particular issue. Multiple agencies are created. And since then, uh, government has failed to implement the Orosa's report, simply because they need to keep these jobs in those agencies are jobs, you know, uh, uh, can go for the boys, uh, rather than looking at the national, the imperative of national spending court, you know, that to fund the priorities like education. So we've been in this log jam 
um, right from immediately after Obasu just let him till now. And um, now we find ourselves in a situation where we are unable to fund um, education, we are unable to fund the health sector. So we've been having rampant, you know, strike actions both in the health and the education sector. Yeah. Specifically on the education sector, since 2009, the federal government reached an agreement you know, with us. And that agreement was renegotiated in 2018, again, by this very particular uh, Waris government. Um, it, when it comes to implementation, the federal government is short on that. We've seen the federal government refusing to implement you know, agreements that would you know, improve education, save the country a lot of funds on foreign exchange. And the only way you can understand the savings of foreign exchange if we, um, if we invest in education at all is just to consider in 2018, 77,000 Nigerian students went to Ghana you know, to study in five universities in Ghana. And the total amount of money paid to five universities in Ghana you know, was more than the total budget for all Nigerian universities, federal, state, and whatever. So, so, so it makes me it, it makes me it makes me ask the question. I'm so sorry to, to talk over you, Mr. Show me. It makes yeah. me ask the question because you know sometimes there's that argument that we Nigerians don't want to pay for good education, um, but then we see Nigerians working, at, you know, very hard to pay these school fees abroad. I mean, I've even heard somebody say she's going to school in Benin Republic. You know. Um, it goes to show how bad the situation is here for us to send our children to next door, the next door country. So is it really about us not being willing to pay for good education or it's just that the environment is not conducive enough for good education and learning to happen? Yes. What Nigerians don't want to do is to pay for bad education. They are happy to pay for good education. Otherwise, the private universities in Nigeria will not be surviving by now. What nobody wants to do is, you know, to, 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 to subvent inefficiency, to subvent poor education. And what government needs to do is to invest in it. The only way you can gauge government performance on education is to consider the UNESCO recommendation. Okay. Uh, okay. To fund education. Have we ever even funded education to the level of 20%? We've never been able to do that. Never been able to do that. If you look at the current budget, we're looking at a figure of between 7 and 8%. So if it's a far cry from what is needed to fund education. So therefore, even encouraging Nigerians in Nigerian universities, encouraging people to fund, you know, to support um, bad education. Government needs to go back to the drawing table with ASU, draw up a plan of action to transform Nigerian universities into world-class universities so that Nigerians will be too happy and foreigners will be, 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 will be too happy, you know, to pay to uh, receive education here in Nigeria. Okay. We should, there's no reason why in Africa we should not partake in education tourism. Why can't we create first-class institutions, you know, like University of Dar es Salaam, where many people, you know, rush to now, and then, you know, we can benefit from it use the extra resources, you know, me, you know, to invest in other sectors of the economy. So okay. this is the major problem. That is what ASU is fighting for. ASU okay. wants the Nigerian universities to return back to his old glory days, where University of Ife in those days, now Obafemi Awolo University, Unilag, UN Enunsuka, University of Ibadan, compete, you know, with the best, you know, universities in the world. We okay. have since long moved away from there. And that is what ASU is fighting for. That is why federal government needs to listen. It is in the interest of our economy. We cannot continue to train our big students and throw them out. Nobody is going to employ them. They are either unemployable or when they get into the economy, the productivity. Uh, I think that we lost uh, the country of us tremendous from it, uh, the economy. So, in whose interest uh, okay. are we? All right. In news, let are me, we serving when we refuse to fund education properly? Let me throw in it back. Case, let me throw it back to Deji. Unfortunately, we're having some connection issues with you, Mr. Shomi, but uh, we'll come back to you. Uh, Deji, there are those who also say that this might be deliberate on the part of our leaders, being that there are several ways to um, go about dealing with the ASU situation. 
Um, and just like Mr. Shobumi said, we've been graduating half-baked in his words. I chose his words. Um, half-baked graduates from our different universities and every year we're churning them out. But could this be a deliberate move from politicians, from governments? And, and also, as he mentioned, uh, the SDGs on education, we have barely scratched the surface. When you look at our budgets year in, year out, the budgets do not hardly reflect anything on education. It's a meager, meager sum that is, you know, allotted to education. Why do you think that we are paying this least attention to education, which should be the most important, uh, I mean, after healthcare? Uh, thank you very much, um, Mimi. Um, well, I think that the greatest challenge that we face as a people is the leadership challenge. Because if you look at the education budgets and health budgets side by side with how much the National Assembly is allocated in the budget, you would see that there's a very huge disparity. Um, for instance, I think 2021 budget, 465 people in the National Assembly and more than the combined allocation for the health and education sector. I mean, that, that tells you that there's a deliberate, there's a systemic uh, attempt to ensure that our educational sector and our health sector are rendered comatose. Because if you see what's going on, there's an agreement between the federal government and us, an agreement voluntarily entered into by the government. Both parties sat down and agreed. Now you have a case where a professor in the Nigerian university is earning about 500,000 naira. That's the highest level of the, of, of the professor at Keda, 500,000 naira. Meanwhile, that amount is not even enough as running allowance or running costs for a as of a member. So it means that our priorities are misplaced. If you allocate that much money for politicians, while you leave those in the academia, those who produce the graduates, who, who, who supply you with the human resources that the country needs to develop with peanuts, then, I mean, uh, there's a need for an overhaul of the entire system. We've advocated that we should return to part-time legislators, people who are gatefully employed, who will come and legislate at maybe in the evenings or part-time on part-time basis, but not full-time uh, legislators, lawmakers who sit down in Abuja. Sometimes on TV, you see that they are sleeping, either sleeping or absent. You see important motions are being moved by their serious colleagues, and you find a very scanty number of people in the House or in the in, 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 in the in the Senate chamber. So that tells you that there's a disconnect between what these people are going there to do and what they're actually doing. Because you're supposed that by the constitution you are required to go and make laws for the betterment of the people. And the people <laughs> include the students who are at home, the students who are not able to go to school for the past hundred days, so that's why in final year, some in, some who are going to, supposed to go to, to law school, some are supposed to go and start the housemanship. All of them are just there at home doing nothing, all because of these politicians. There's an agreement that is in place, as respected for this welfare. Now, every now and then you see that the government establishes universities federal university here and there to satisfy their political, their, their, their political cronies. So who is fooling who? You have universities that are not properly funded. The libraries are obsolete in terms of uh, stock of books. The laboratories are not properly equipped. You have medical students who cannot have facilities that are sit on the heart. You can't, so, so you see that the challenge that is, that is there for all to see. But the government is disinterested. The politicians are also disinterested in what's going on. Like I told you when I began, I said, when it comes to sharing money, there is no tribalism involved. There is no religion involved. They are united in sharing money. But when it comes to things that will move the country forward, you will not find them, you will not find them advancing the people's cause. They are all about themselves. So I, I just to answer your question, it is deliberate. It is systemic. And if you find out what's going on here, most Nigerians, who are even the middle class, don't send their children to federal universities anymore. They send them to the private universities. So what does that tell you? You will see that if you observe, that's what they did to the, private, to the public primary schools. They did the same thing to the public secondary schools. And now they're doing the same to the public universities. They're gradually eroding people, public confidence in them and systemically ensuring that people are not going there anymore. Because before you send your child to school, now, there have been two strikes in about three years. Mm. I mean, a combined, a combined of a period of about seven months now, if you, if you tally it up, seven months. Some schools are still running the, the session of 2019 before COVID. They're able to start a new session now, and there's another strike ongoing. 
So students cannot graduate. Those who are doing their PhDs cannot graduate. Masters cannot graduate. LOBs cannot, uh, bachelors cannot graduate. So what are we talking about? So it is systemic and it's deliberate and it is wicked on the part of the government. It's very wicked because if you enter into an agreement, it is parka sun savanda. You enter into an agreement with the person, you must honor the agreement. Mm. You cannot come back and say that it was it was entered into erroneously. Let that me, cannot avail you as a defense. Let me ask uh, uh, this question. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, I see that we're saying that government, and I'm not in any way trying to absolve government of the blame that they ought to carry in, in, on this particular matter, but um, in terms of us always finding other options when our leaders do not live up to, you know, the, the leadership that we have handed to them. For example, like you said, the middle class person is sending their children to private universities. And some even sending them abroad, you know, scraping the bottom of, you know, their uh, piggy banks to send these children abroad. But what are we supposed to do to make sure that these people who we call leaders, who are supposedly to serve us and do whatever it is they're doing in our best interest, what are we supposed to do them to do to them to get them to do their jobs? Because it's okay, it's 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 not enough for us to be crying foul and saying, well, the government is not doing its job. Who's going to make them do that? Is that not supposed to be our job to keep them accountable and responsible? Correct. Absolutely correct. We should not forget one thing, that one of the drivers for corruption in Nigeria is the desire to fund education of wards outside Nigeria. And you see parents holding public offices, you know, looking for other ways and means to accumulate capital, even primitively, to the extent of being able to fund those luxurious education for their children. So therefore, if we fail to build our own institutions here, which the same people are the ones responsible for, then we'll continue to have corruption thriving in our country. So one of the ways in which we can do this is first, um, somebody came up with that suggestion in the House of Reps, I think, and the, his colleagues um, rejected it. There's a new opportunity for Nigerians. Nigerians should ask anybody seeking for their votes what is their view on education, on sending their children abroad to school. But Mr. Show me anybody, anybody can tell us what we want to hear. It's very easy. A desperate person who wants to get our votes can tell us what we want to hear. How about we Absolutely. begin to make demands instead of asking questions and getting very, you know, nice answers as opposed to what will happen in reality? Absolutely. It's one of the ways in which to sensitize political um, office seekers about the priorities, you know, of um, the rank and file Nigerians who they need their votes. Even though they will tell you yes, when they get there, they will do something else. But at the end of the day, uh, they will be more sensitive to the fact that there's the likelihood that a movement, <coughs> excuse me, will build along this line uh, towards forcing them or compelling them to do the right thing. We work very close to it with NSAS, say for the agenda, you know, the, the, the youth fails to include education as part of the agenda, you know, and um, I would not be surprised if in the nearest future, uh, we would see either the National Association of Nigerians or some other or civil society groups, you know, galvanizing public uh, opinion and also mobilizing people to work compelling the federal government, you know, to listen and, you know, uh, not, not, the, not precisely the federal government, the National Assembly, you know, to do the biddings of people, but applauding the children of pol political office holders, you know, from studying abroad. The moment they know that their children will be affected, believe me, they will pay more attention, they will vote more money, you know, uh, to the educational sector in Nigeria. Okay. But except we do that, I cannot see um, uh, the, the ruling class, you know, yielding easily. Don't forget they have a very rapacious, you know, um, um, test, you know, for public wealth. Deji, I, I want you to chime in on this. I can imagine you nodding <laughs> your head. <laughs> but, yes, but, but before I, you I, answer, I, I, I had a member of the House of Representatives here on the show last night, and he was talking about, you know, certain ills in the National Assembly, including himself, and talking about the fact that um, 
legislators are only passing bills and making laws that only are in their interest. And I ask the question, if I'm benefiting from these legislations and it's helping me, and I've been there for 30 to 35 years, why would I want to change it? So yes, he's saying that we should make them do those things, but <laughs> really, is that it? Can we really do that? Will, will it ever happen if we, we the people, don't do something? Well, well honestly, um, I was nodding along to what Mr. Shomu was saying, uh, but I want to differ a little bit um, as it relates to accountability of the elected officials. Now, don't forget that right now we're in the uh, election season. Uh, a lot of uh, primaries um, held across Nigeria, I, guess, I think today and yesterday, uh, for, of the PDP. And you could see on social media um, the amount that these delegates were expending. Uh, you've seen the news about uh, people asking for a refund of their money or getting a few uh, less votes than they expected or anticipated. Now, a system that allows people to pay their pay delegates or have delegates determine who becomes the flag bearer, who a person spends all that money to get to the, that particular office, does not think that it's accountable to the people. He thinks it's accountable first to himself and his pockets. And then to his cronies who got him there. So you have a crisis in terms of accountability because uh, ordinarily the constitution says when you get there, you're, good, you're supposed to go there and make laws. But the first thing you need to do is to recoup how much you have spent, first and foremost. Then, you know, try and get some more money uh, to, 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 bo to bolster your finances for the next election. So, really and truly, working for the people is not priority. Now, the only way we can get these people to do our bidding is to activate the recall process. And even at that, you saw what happened with, um, I think it was Dino Melaye that was, about, what, that was uh, about to be recalled, or you saw what happened with the process. Mm. They ensure that they thwarted the process along the line. So there's a process for recalling the lawmakers. <laughs> we can actually explore the opportunity. But we need to have a strong base, a base that would, that, that would not be shaken by financial law considerations, because eventually you can't recall these lawmakers. And that's what happens in every advanced society, in every civil society. People have left uh, political offices for less abroad. But in Nigeria, people do a lot of things. There was a senator who slapped uh, somebody, in, uh, I think it was a senator or a member, I think it was Senator Abba or something in Abuja, who slapped somebody on camera. I don't know what became of him eventually, but I'm not sure that he left, he was, he was asked to leave his, his seat. No, and you have a lot of instances of people who have done all kinds of things and who have remained in power. So the problem is that we don't have a culture of accountability yet, of recalling lawmakers, of, of ensuring that people resign their offices. And that's the problem we are facing because we just, you know, we have a very, um, very large bandwidth for accommodating nonsense in Nigeria. We tolerate a lot of hardship. We just make excuses and we keep taking it and taking it. And I'm sure we said we happened, almost happened with answers until political interest intervened and it's cut through the entire process. But we need to rise up as a people to demand these changes. Otherwise, it's very impossible and impracticable for persons who are benefiting from the system to now cause the change that we desire. Like I said, a, a, a senator who gets to the National Assembly who's being paid these fat allowances who will not refuse it whether he's a pastor or an imam, he will not refuse his allowances because that is what he has met on ground. And if he tries to refuse it or tries to make a, a propose a motion for, for, for an amendment, his colleagues will shut him down. And that's okay. democracy for you. Majority will always have their way. The majority will have their say, but the majority will always have their way. So if you're outnumbered in terms of people who have like minds, who want to build a better country, and you're outnumbered, then there's a problem. Because there's no there's so much you can do if you're in a minority. And that's why we are where we are. And until there's an holistic approach to changing all that we have we currently have as a structure in Nigeria, I think we will still continue to sing the same song. Well, the other show me is a political analyst, Deji Awobi Day is a legal practitioner. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. Thank, thank you. Very much. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we come back, we'll be talking about the NMPP and, of course, their plans towards 2023. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.